For more on the effects of uh, Larry Summers' uh, departure, Hans, we're joined now by William Galston of the Brookings Institution. He was a senior domestic policy advisor to President Clinton. And also we have Jim Glickenhaus, partner at Glickenhaus and Company. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, William Galston, is this a significant move for the president's economic team, or is this something that happens in the normal course of events? Two years, particularly during a recession, can be a very long time. Well, both are true. It is a significant departure, but it's not unusual. Jobs in the White House at a high level are really exhausting. Uh, and as someone who left after two and a half years, <laughs> I can tell you that after two years, if you've been dealing with the kinds of issues that Larry Summers has been dealing with on a continuing basis, you are wrung out. And so from that standpoint, I think it's not remarkable at all. On the other hand, he was, by all accounts, the most powerful single voice on the economic team, and that's, his departure is bound to have a big impact. Jim Glickenhaus, uh, Larry Summers' voice on the economic team, in some people's eyes, seemed to be that he was too pro-business. I mean, he's written in the past as an economist that the capital gains tax, very inefficient way to spur economic growth. What does the economic team need in the future in order to, let's say, convince business that there are pro-growth policies in the White House favoring corporations? Well, I really don't think it's about business. I think that uh, Obama is seriously worried about the poll numbers and the advances uh, that the Republicans may make in November. And I think that even though technically they're claiming the recession is over, the average person doesn't think it's over. Uh, the average person sees that jobs are very hard to get. Is the average person is very worried. And uh, I think this is uh, really more about shaking things up to try to convince the American voters that Obama is in control of this and has some ideas and is going to bring in some people who will effectuate change. I think that's what this is really about. William Galston, what do you make of that? Well, I have a slightly different interpretation, although it may not be inconsistent with what you just heard. Uh, we already know that the political situation after this election is going to be very different from the political situation during the first two years of the Obama administration. There is no possibility of putting together majorities based on Democrats and a handful of Republicans. There won't be after November, even if the Democrats hang on to the House of Representatives and the Senate by the skin of their teeth. And so we're either going to have two years of gridlock or we're going to have different policies and a different kind of conversation between the two political parties. And so the president has an opportunity to consider personnel changes in the context of larger strategic changes. Well, there you have the confirmation that Larry Summers will be leaving the White House uh, in November, Jim Glickenhaus. As William Galston points out, after the midterm elections, things might look very different in Congress. Do you think that influences who the president picks to succeed Larry Summers? Well, I think it absolutely does. I mean, I think you can see it in what Hillary Clinton said. When Hillary Clinton came out, really the day after Obama talked about uh, that, you know, he was hoping possibly for some more stimulus, and she cautioned against unbridled runaway spending, I think, uh, you know, people are jockeying for position. And I think people are saying, hey, the American public, no matter what you are doing, do not feel it's working. So you better do something that makes them feel that works, because if you don't, they're going to vote you out. And uh, I don't think anything is sacred or anything couldn't happen here. I mean, these are wild times. I mean, you, the race in Delaware, you see someone who, you know, is foreclosed on, has never had a real job, uh, may have used her campaign funding to, to rent her apartment, and you stick a camera in front of people on the street and they say, yeah, so what? She's like me. And I think you're seeing anger, and this anger could really have an incredible effect on the political landscape. And I, I think Obama sees that, and I hope that he's going to try to reach out and get some people in there who are going to get us out of this recession. I don't believe we're out of the recession, and are going to get jobs, because if jobs aren't created, 
uh, whoever's in power is going to be voted out. All right, we want to continue the coverage of our breaking news. Larry Summers, the White House, now confirming that the Obama economic advisor will be leaving the economic team in, the, in November following the midterm elections. We're joined by William Galston of the Brookings Institution. He was senior domestic policy advisor to President Clinton. We also have Jim Glickenhaus, partner at Glickenhaus and Company. William Galston, Jim Glickenhaus brought up this emotion, this anger that seems to be evident in the electorate. Do you think that had a factor in the departure of Larry Summers? No, I really don't. I think that uh, Larry has probably been thinking over the timing in terms of his departure for a long time. Uh, and I don't think he was pushed out or induced to leave by the tone and temper of the electorate. Uh, but I do think he realized that his particular policies had gone as far as they were going to go. Uh, and that uh, it was going to be a lot less fun in the next two years for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I would add something else, and that is that, uh, that I think we've seen a test of pure Keynesian orthodoxy in the past couple of years, and it hasn't worked out all that well, in part because of what some dissenting economists were saying all along, namely that financial downturns are different from cyclical recessions. And I don't think the administration's policies were sensitive enough to that, and that's part of the turn that they're going to have to make going forward. Is that because there is a contradiction between economists and indeed political advisors as to what's necessary, William Galston, to actually move the economy forward and get it working again? Because it seems as if you have Keynesian policies on one hand, which would indicate stimulus. On the other hand, you have Larry Summers, who's been a big advocate of free markets and indeed was a big supporter of the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Well, that's true, but, Glar but Larry was certainly a big advocate of stimulus, uh, both publicly and privately. I think what perhaps he and others didn't understand clearly enough was that if you have households with huge unsustainable debt to disposable income ratios, then if you give them more money, they're going to use a lot of that money to pay down debt to reduce their leverage rather than to go out and buy new stuff. And when they do go out to buy new stuff, this is a global economy, they're likely to buy cheap stuff made some in some other country. And so you don't get the same kind of multiplier that orthodox Keynesian theory and perhaps some past practice said that you would. And so you need to think very differently about how to get capital off the sidelines and into productive use. Jim Glickenhaus, is it possible that Larry Summers and the president's economic team said yes to just too many things? Well, whatever they said yes or no to, it, it didn't work as judged by the electorate. I mean, I think if you look at the banks, uh, we didn't let them go broke. There was no punishment to the equity holders, except in the case perhaps of Lehman Brothers and uh, the destruction of wealth, but we didn't wipe out the, the equity holders of some of the big banks. And what did we do? We, we, the government gives them billions of dollars and uh, they hold on to it. Uh, we give it to them for free and they buy treasury bills, clip coupons and sit there and say, well, we're just being more sober about who we're lending to. This isn't helping America. I mean, what we need are people in these banks who find real people who have real need, who will be able to pay it back and to lend it so that this will result in growth as opposed to what William was talking about, simply paying down debt that was unsustainable. That doesn't help the economy grow. But how how is it possible that a noted economist would not find the, the, the idea that giving people who are deeply in debt more money, why wouldn't it be rational that they would use some of that money to pay down debt? I mean, why would they think that they would just go out and keep spending when they're getting letters saying in the mail, you better pay up or we're going to send the collection agency after you? Well, well there are a lot of people who, who didn't see it coming. I mean, you know, Michael Lewis pointed out in the great short, those that saw it coming were incredibly rewarded and some people saw it coming. Others didn't, but I think that what happened was there was a mania 
and people really believed that the tree was growing in the sky, that there would always be a greater fool to buy that condominium in Miami, and it would go on forever. Well, it didn't go on forever, and the difference in this time was the numbers have just gotten so astronomical. I mean, it used to be that, you know, $100,000 was a lot of money, then a million dollars was a lot of money, now a billion dollars, and now they talk about a trillion. People have no idea how big a trillion is. I mean, I think a million <laughs> seconds is like 12 and a half days. A trillion seconds is 33 years. I mean, people don't understand that math. William Galston, do people need to understand some new math, and will the president's new advisors help us figure this out and give us the tools to learn this new math? Well, I sure hope so. I mean, you know, the, I think the two things that the administration ignored uh, and has paid the price are, number one, uh, that they didn't figure out how to stabilize and restart the housing market. Uh, the anti-foreclosure uh, provisions of their policy have been ineffective and inadequate by their own accounting and by their own numbers. And secondly, during the campaign, the president had some very good ideas uh, as to how to bring private capital to bear on the country's infrastructure needs through a public-private partnership and an infrastructure bank. That was a big idea. And I think if that had been implemented early in the administration, uh, you'd see a lot more jobs in in projects that have to be built here in the United States with jobs that cannot be sent overseas. All right, we've got more. Right, we're going to have more. more we're going to have more. We continue our coverage of our exclusive report. White House Economic Advisor Larry Summers is expected to, well, he's been confirmed that the White House saying that he will step down following the November midterm elections. Uh, joining the conversation, we, of course, have a Jim Glickenhaus of Glickenhaus and & Company and William Galston of Brookings Institute. I want to bring in Joseph Mason, finance professor and and chair of banking at Louisiana State University. Professor Mason has said that Larry Summers was too tied to Wall Street. And I want to find out, Joseph Mason, does his departure change your opinion of the economic team at the, uh, at the administration's level? Well, it really, to me, raises questions about where this economic team is going. Um, Really, we lost Christy Romer, now Larry Summers. Uh, you know, for for Larry's ties to the street, his hedge fund advising, that type of thing. Um, I, I think he's more suited to some of the the tasks at hand. While, of course, you could talk about conflicts of interest, but at least we had uh, people in there kind of familiar with financial markets and uh, monetary and macroeconomic policy there for a while. I think we're getting too far away from that right now, and we need uh, really you know, macro economists for macro problems. And this is one of the problems we've had in the discussion lately about why economists didn't see this coming or economists didn't see this. They're 50, 60 different kinds of economists just on the Journal of Economic Literature's breakdowns. Uh, I, I think you need a, a really talented macroeconomist in there right now who's skilled at dealing with these uh, financial crisis recovery issues. And I think we lost a, one of the few of those around uh, Christy Romer, and that, that's going to be a big, big deficit. And now with Larry going, that's going to be even more. William Galston, you mentioned that uh, there were two things that you think the administration has really failed to do. One is deal with the issue having to do with housing, and the other is putting into practice some of the proposals that President Obama talked about while he was campaigning for office. What does he need to do now in order to fulfill some of those pledges? Uh, well, first of all, he has to realize uh, that those are two incomplete successes in his administration, and he has, he has to commit himself to doing more and doing better over the next two years. And secondly, he needs advisors who believe uh, that economic policy and economic recovery involves more than macroeconomic stimulus, that if you're dealing with a financially induced downturn, you need to pay attention to the institutions whereby private capital uh, is put to work. Uh, and, uh, and right now we have a situation where, according to the Fed, almost $2 trillion of corporate capital are sitting on the sidelines. And so the title of the forthcoming movie turns out not to be correct because money sometimes sleeps 
And we have $2 trillion of sleeping money right now that nobody has figured out how to put to productive use. Jim Glickenhaus, where does the departure of Larry Summers leave Ben Bernanke and Timothy Geithner? Are they capable of trying to figure out, as William Galston said, how to get that sleeping money out into the real economy? Well, I think you saw by the Fed today that they're certainly aware of it and they're concerned with it. I mean, I think effectively they eased. They can't really ease, but I think their actions today show where they're leaning. Uh, that said, these are really deep and serious problems. And uh, in a strange way, I think Wall Street is almost betting and hoping that there's gridlock. Because it's almost as if if there's gridlock, it's going to be better than people who really don't have a clue how to run this machine to try to fly it. The idea being that if you don't know how to fix it, don't try to fix it. I exactly. I mean, I, I think that if you see uh, the Republicans do well in November, you're going to see a huge move in the stock market up in the short term. And I think it's just going to be a relief that, it, well, no matter what, they're not going to be doing wacky things for a couple of months. Joseph Mason, what do you make about the prospects for the midterm elections and its effect on the economy and the president's team? Uh, I agree that it, as bad as financial risk is right now and as bad as financial intermediation is right now, policy risk is worse than financial risk. Uh, and markets are willing to take the, the long, hard, slow crawl out of this uh, very lengthy recession uh, in exchange for avoiding that, that tremendous disruption of policy risk, which, which can't be modeled and, and can't be valued very easily. Uh, Right now, though, it is really important for the administration to realize that uh, the, the main problem on the street remains information asymmetry. Uh, people thought they were holding blue chip stuff, AAA, uh, RMBS, and the like, only to find out it wasn't what they thought it was. They're trying to figure out where to put their money, and they still can't believe financial reports, uh, much less administration reports of economic recovery, and still don't know where to place their funds. And as long as they don't know where to put them, the the economy is going to drag, and we're going to continue down this path. Joseph Mason, do you have any kind of estimate for what is going to turn out as a result of the midterm election? What is the Congress going to look like? Well, the, the Congress is going to look much more Republican. The question is, are the Republicans going to do uh, much different than the Democrats? One of the key things that needs to be done uh, right now, and it, it's going to sound tremendously unpopular, but uh, one way to stimulate growth is to remove unneeded regulations in the economy, uh, whether you're talking financial market regulations, energy regulations, automobiles. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the books that goes back many, many years years that is unneeded, and that can, uh, getting rid of those regulations can unleash a lot of economic growth. Uh, but of course, nobody wants to look at that now, whether you're talking, you know, the right. situation in the Gulf of Mexico or the financial market blow We're going to have to leave it else. there.